Please note that I'm already recording, so we will um, start off with the uh, usual disclaimers and um, hyperledger related uh, announcements. One is we are operating under the antitrust rules of the Linux Foundation of which Hyperledger is a part. And uh, the antitrust rules essentially state that we should not be engaging in any antitrust or trust busting uh, activities here. I mean, sorry, antitrust activities here. Uh, the details can be found in uh, Linux Foundation antitrust rules which are quite extensive uh, but uh, basically um, what we we say is that anybody who participates in these uh, abides by those rules that's the first thing second is that uh, we also go by the hyperledger code of conduct which basically says we have to respect each other and consider uh, even people who disagree with us um, with respect and uh, treat each other uh, kindly. Thanks uh, for all joining. And I think without uh, much of a uh, lag, we are gonna have Will present on CBDC, since uh, the Bank of England has uh, really extensively uh, researched this topic and has been on the forefront of that work, uh, we expect to hear lots of things that are cutting edge or at least on the top of mind for the uh, for central banks and Bank of England is, uh, you know, in the forefront of some of these activities, especially the RTGS uh, renewal, so the wholesale CBDC and the uh, retail CBDC and how they relate to each other would be of particular interest to us. Um, and without waiting too long, I think uh, Will should take over and he, sh he can um, share a screen if he has problems, then we will, um, then we'll assist him, okay? Uh, thanks. Please add your names to the uh, to the uh, agenda and notes because that's very important. Thanks again, and Will, please take it away. Okay, thank you, uh, Vipin, for that great introduction. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is. Uh, Will Lovell. Um, I've got some slides which I am going to screen share with you right now. So uh, hopefully you can see those. Um, I'm going to speak, I imagine, for about uh, 20 minutes to half an hour, so I'll leave plenty of time for questions as well. So I'll quickly explain who I am. Uh, my name's Will Lovell. I have the job title of Head of Future Technology at the Bank of England, uh, which means I'm part of the technology organisation, but I work very, very closely with my colleagues in um, the policy areas of the bank as well. Um, I spend a lot of my time looking at payments, but also at digital currencies. So uh, Vipin and I have known each other for some time, um, originally through the Hyperledger Trade Finance SIG, and uh, I gave uh, a similar presentation to this in the public sector SIG that I've come here to talk to you hopefully about the kinds of things you want to hear about um, if there's bits I miss or you want to hear more we'll, we'll pick that up as we go or in the questions I'm sure so um, let's have a look right so this is what I wanted to uh, talk about today First of all, I'm just going to talk a bit about the role of the Bank of England within the UK payment system, um, which is quite similar to 
most central banks or monetary authorities in different parts of the world. Um, we're all slightly different. We all have slightly different things that we do, but actually in broad terms, it's the same. And I'm going to talk about that really to frame the rest of the conversation. We're then going to look at wholesale and retail CBDCs um, and how they differ, um, what the, if you like, the uh, concise difference between them is. And that then takes us to a little bit of a look at the infrastructure. I'm not going to go deeply into the infrastructure on this, more uh, to characterise um, the differences between the two, but also to share some of the thinking, uh, particularly around retail digital currencies that we've been doing in the bank. Um, I'm then going to talk about the role of standards. I think there's a tremendous amount going on in standards generally that we can leverage for CBDCs, but there's probably more work specific to, uh, to digital currencies and digital currencies on the blockchain that needs to be done. Um, so we can talk a bit about that. And finally, um, I'm going to talk about the UK RTGS renewal and how that supports uh, digital currency. So that's a bit, bit of an agenda. Um, let's start off with this. So this is the Bank of England mission statement, which is to promote the good of the people of the United Kingdom through monetary stability and financial stability. So the first thing there, we are a public organisation. Um, we are uh, providing services that are very much in support of the UK economy. So everything that I'm about to talk about, but also all of the work that we do really goes in that direction. So we are looking at what the UK economy needs. And this is what I was talking about when I was saying this is generally what the central banks and monetary authorities, how they approach their work. The second part of that is around monetary stability and financial stability. So monetary stability is talking about stable prices, which, uh, which we approach generally through the setting of interest rates. And financial stability is about having a stable system. So this is about having an economy where people can start businesses, where they can transact through the banking sector, and they know that their money is going to be safe when they put it in a bank. They know that when they make uh, payments or other sorts of transactions, that those transactions are going to succeed. And there's lots of really good research that shows, actually, if you don't have that underlying faith that your banking system and your transactions are going to work properly, then it's an enormous drag on economic productivity it's an enormous drag on the creation of wealth so this is where it starts to relate to things like um, payment systems digital currencies um, and modern technology these things uh, have a great opportunity to be able to create a faster more reliable financial system um, that is that is good for the people transacting it, but actually creates good generally. There's also a risk in there that if we don't get this right, that it starts to threaten um, the financial stability um, and prices more generally. So that was really my framing piece. This is, this is how we start. Let's move on a little bit now to look at how um, we think about wholesale and retail digital currencies um, in the Bank of England. Um, we've got this quite simple model that was um, drawn up by um, a couple of our economists that, that I find really useful. So we look first of all at obviously a um, currency, a fiat currency is central bank issued. Um, there's then a question about uh, it being accessible. So if you have centrally bank issued money that is universally accessible, as of today, that is banknotes. So um, the Bank of England, the Federal Reserve, um, European Central Bank, uh, and so on, we issue banknotes that are universally accessible, everyone can use. But we're not talking about banknotes today, we're talking about digital currencies. So we need to think about what happens when these things become electronic. Well, 
we already have universally accessible electronic money and that's bank deposits so if you make a payment through visa debit or if you're uh, making a payment by wire transfer what you're really doing is an electronic transfer of bank deposits and that's universally accessible you can see that there and actually we have electronic um, central bank issued money as well that's typically called reserves now you see that that pops outside the circle of universally accessible because typically reserves are only available to uh, commercial banks so you can start to see we've got this picture of money that's backed by the central bank it's issued by the central bank money that's accessible and money that's electronic and you can see the big gap that we've put in the center there and that's really where a retail central bank digital currency sits so it's something that everybody can use it's universally accessible but it's issued by the central bank and it's also an electronic medium so a retail central bank digital currency is actually something quite new um, although it has features of things that we've seen before it's actually something that hasn't existed. Wholesale digital currencies, however, do exist, um, or something similar to them actually exist already. So if, you ma if you're making a, um, something, a, say a Fedwire payment or a CHAPS payment in the UK or a Target payment in Euro, something like that, um, what you're actually doing is moving central bank issued reserves electronically. So a wholesale central bank digital currency is actually um, a different form of a thing that already exists, whereas a retail one is actually something quite new. And I thought that, th that this picture actually um, shows that uh, difference from a sort of policy and definition perspective and that difference becomes really really important when we start to think about um, how these things are implemented what the implementation challenges are and then ultimately the types of technology that need to sit below them so let's take a look at that now um, this is diagram uh, that we use quite a lot and that reflects the current thinking in the Bank of England about retail central bank digital currencies. Um, and it's a layered model. Um, so we'll start at the top and work down and then may, maybe actually I'll work back up from the bottom so we can, we can see really how these things fit together. So at the top, you can see here, we have the central bank core ledger which is going to have to be very fast it's going to have to be very secure so this is the um if you like the central bank doing the thing that only we can do um, this this money is issued on our balance sheet so we need to keep very very tight control of how that money moves around our balance sheet and what those exposures are but as a central bank, you know, th thinking back to my first slide, we're, we're really a bunch of policy people who are thinking about that monetary stability and operational stability. We're not thinking about a uh, user proposition. We're not thinking so much about actually what end users want and, and, and arguably neither should we. So what we started to realize was we wanted to provide some sort of access layer that will probably be through um, a set of quite tightly defined APIs that would allow payment interface providers to come in and create products that are based on that ledger that they can then start to offer to users. So that's really how it, it flows through, if you like, from the central bank through to end users. And let's just work back up that stack to think about what that means. So this is very much about the user proposition. How are people going to interact with this thing? Now, in countries like the UK, we already have a, a fairly comprehensive set of payment services that are um, available electronically. You know, we have uh, Visa Debit, we have an instant payment 
um, solution that we call faster payments that works pretty well. We also have a uh, bulk retail that's used for things like uh, um, state benefits and payroll and you know uh, sort of those kind of bulk use cases. So this has to be something that that does does a new thing that people want. So that was those kind of services that very user focused. Um, set of uh, outcomes is where we see the payment interface providers coming in. Companies, uh, either be they existing banks, be they existing payment service providers, that can come in and create those innovative products. Those payment interface providers would then access the central bank through our API access layer and we would be running that core ledger to make sure that the um, uh, that the money uh, transfers accurately, securely, and quickly, um, and to make sure that people can have the same level of trust in their central bank digital currency as they currently have in the banknotes that they hold in their hand. So that's really quite a, um, you know, hopefully you can understand quite a well-defined uh, model that we're currently working on. Um, I was presenting some of this uh, material earlier in the week uh, to some um, uh, postgraduate students who, who asked the question, is this the only model? And it may well be that it's not, but it's, this is certainly the central case model that, that, that we are working on within the bank at the moment. The wholesale model looks quite different. Sadly, I don't have a, a diagram to show about this. But thinking back to that earlier slide where I was showing the overlapping circles, a wholesale central bank digital currency uh, is doing something that is, at least in theory, already possible. So a wholesale central bank digital currency needs to be offering services that are difficult to, um, to access through making the more sort of traditional, if you like, wire transfer services. And I've put down a, a list of things here that I'm just going to talk through that how a wholesale central bank digital currency might uh, differ from the current financial infrastructure uh, that we have. So the first one is access. Um, I mean, this is, this is uh, a particular particularly uh, an issue within, uh, within the UK that we're, that we're working on. But I think it's probably maybe more general. And, it, and, and it's one of this, that the costs of accessing a high value payment system, um, like uh, chaps in Sterling, are quite high. And that limits it to uh, larger banks and larger financial institutions. And quite often the rule books um, limit access as well. So there's an interesting question that can a wholesale central bank digital currency kind of make the benefits of central bank money settlement available to a broader group of people? It's a question. There are lots of um, regulatory um, and policy things to think about there as well. But if it can just even lower the cost of access, that could um, open the service up to people who theoretically could, could access central bank money now, but actually practically the, the costs don't make sense. The second point I put was around efficiency. So looking at some of the, uh, the people who are developing products around wholesale CBDC. Um, a lot of what they're looking for are efficiencies by eliminating things like reconciliation breaks. So the ability to see the exact status of transactions, to see delivery versus payment on a blockchain, to be able to know the exact position of your portfolio and your, your liquidity. Now, um, you know, hypothetically, that is possible now, although when you actually look at the number of systems that you have to integrate to and gathering real-time data from them, this is really, really difficult, which is why we end up with the, you know, what's often referred to as the reconciliation mountain of so many different uh, 
sets of transactions and pots of liquidity that it's very difficult to keep track on. So a wholesale CBDC issued onto a blockchain can create some efficiency there. And that takes us to my third point as well, speed. Um, if you're able to track more efficiently, then you should be able to transact more quickly. Um, and the last point there being integration, being able to, for example, uh, if you have tokens um, that you're in different currencies that you're able to transact, you're able to actually integrate to do things like foreign exchange settlement, perhaps, um, at a greater speed and greater efficiency. From a central bank perspective, the wholesale CBDC is slightly more straightforward because it, it looks a little bit more like what we already have. And we've done some proof of concept work in the Bank of England, looking at uh, working with people like uh, Baton, working with people like uh, R3, working with people like, um, well, Clearmatics uh, and uh, the, the USC that's now called Finality, saying, actually, if we took our current settlement models and exposed them through an API, would they support the kind of wholesale use cases that you have? Um, and in general terms, we found that they can. So really, we've got a contrast there. Uh, I think wholesale CBDCs are looking to... Um, to, to, to take a set of services and use new technology um, to make them more effective. A retail CBDC is really um, opening up something that, that is, I would say, you know, is so new what one can consider not it, it, it being something new that doesn't currently exist. I wanted to talk a little bit um, about the role of standards. Um, I think there are quite a few standards already that we can leverage. I think there is more uh, work to be done in, the sta in standards. And then I think um, we need to look also about where standards move beyond data exchange. So I've put other standards at the bottom and I'll talk a bit more about what I mean by that when we get there. So first of all, um, I've put ICO, ISO 20022 for transactions. Um, there's a tremendous amount of work has gone on and will continue to go on on the ISO 2022 standards. Um, we are working very hard on that in the bank. We are looking to harmonise payments within the UK, first of all, onto ISO 20022. So the different sorts of payment systems will use um, not only the ISO 20022 standard, but something that we call the UK Common Credit Message as well, so that we can lower costs uh, for people making payments um, and also um, increase um, accuracy. Uh, we're also working internationally as part of the HVPS Plus group to start to standardise um, across the different high value payment systems um, sterling, euro, uh, dollar, yen, um, Swiss franc, and so on. So having put all that, um, expended all that effort into getting that standardization, uh, I think there's something really good there that we can leverage around digital currencies, because once you get under the bonnet of ISO 20022, what you're really doing there is that you're defining the various parameters and parties and sets of information you need within a transaction. And the same will be true of transacting on a currency as it will transacting within a payment system. So there's lots to, lots to leverage there and I wouldn't want to throw that away. Um, where I think where there's already quite a lot of progress but we will need to make more progress is around digital identity, um, both around individuals and institutions. Um, I'll talk about institutions first because that's possibly slightly easier um, and individuals is, is a more complex picture. So around institutions, uh, again, uh, within the Bank of England, we've done a lot of work to promote the legal entity identifier, LEIs, um, and we'll continue to do so. And that's going to be part of our long-term ISO 
2022 roadmap and we're looking at where it goes beyond that as well so we can really start to get a very clear idea about um, which institutions we're transacting with and starting to get a lot better defined data i think as we start to look at the more um, uh, global and internationalized um, transactions that we start to see with with blockchain and uh, digital currency based solutions this business of being able to know exactly who you are transacting with will become more important that's obviously important for individuals as well um, digital id um, has all sorts of uh, for individuals has all sorts of cultural dimensions to it which is is a whole separate presentation um, uh, but suffice it to say it's thought about very differently in different parts of the world um, in some parts of the world the idea of individuals carrying identity cards is very uncontroversial um, in other part in other places the uk being one of those places um, it's, mu it's much more of a controversial idea. Um, there's some really interesting work going on in the Republic of Ireland at the moment around digital identity. Um, the way they have started to think about it is to actually look at how identity of individuals is managed um, at the moment, which is largely uh, we ask people to turn up in a particular place and perhaps bring some paperwork like a utility bill or a bank statement that uh, that has their address on it which i think we, we can see we ought to be able to do something better than that so there's a way of thinking about this that actually we can rather than start off with perhaps the the ideal of some completely heavily encrypted uh, biometric standard which absolutely definitively identifies you which certainly as a technologist, I, I find that fascinating. We actually start um, um, and work up uh, and say, well, what can we do that's better than the thing we have now? But however we work through this digital identity will, will become more and more important as we start to digitalize both currencies, but transactions more generally. Um, and I think that's going to require standards as well. Um, and that brings me to the next point, really, which is other data exchange. If you look at the frictions that exist on cross-border payments uh, in particular, a lot of that revolves around uh, anti-money laundering and counter-terrorist financing checks. And a lot of it... Uh, ...repeat checks that have already been made because... Um, your jurisdiction requires it or equally because you don't quite have the information that you need um, or that the information perhaps that you that you need has been uh, lost along the chain of transactions and when you start to look at things like ISO 20022 which preserves a lot more data and when you start to add into that uh, initiatives like digital identity you can start to see that the quality of data that comes through an international transaction will go up and we should see those frictions around um, cross-border start to come down. So I think there is an enormous role for standards. I think there are uh, some great standards out there. So a lot of work that's gone on that we must leverage as we start to look at digital currencies, but we should also recognize the gaps that exist. The last thing I added um, under standards was what I've called um, other standards. What I'm talking about here really is what I see as being the standardization questions that we will have to face once we've sort of got through the transaction and, and, and identity uh, problems. And that is things like um, standards for uh, consensus algorithms for example so there are lots of very interesting different approaches to consensus um, actually understanding the strengths and weaknesses of one consensus mechanism over another is a very involved process that requires uh, a lot of prior knowledge i think as we start to move towards platforms 
that um, are dependent upon consensus methodologies for, for trust purposes, it will become important to, have, to know that uh, different consensus methods conform to a certain level or standard in the same way that um, I understand, you know, what different um, cryptographic standards are and what the difference between, um, uh, you know, uh, an AES-256 versus SHA-1 and these kinds of things. We'll start to um, understand more. I'm giving that as an example. I think there are probably other examples out there. Um, I don't think it will necessarily, this is not something that's going to be show stopping, but I think it's something that will start to become more important as these solutions start to mature and start to appear. Um, last of all, I wanted to talk about uh, the role of RTGS renewal um, in, in the Bank of England. So this is, a, uh, this is a piece of work we're doing at the moment. So we are replacing the RTGS solution that we currently have. Um, so for those of you not less familiar with, with the UK, um, RTGS, UK RTGS is um, broadly the same thing as, it's the UK equivalent of Fedwire, uh, or it's the UK equivalent of uh, um, Bodgenet if you're familiar with Japan, or Target if you're familiar with the Euro. Um, but the solution we have at the moment went live in 1996, um, and it works fine. Um, but when we started looking forward to these sort of future challenges, not actually specifically looking forward to uh, central bank digital currency, but looking forward to um, the challenges of a, of a more digitalized, more globalized economy, we realized we needed a new platform. So we are in the process of building that. Um, and these are the five uh, areas that, our, uh, that underpin our vision. So the first is increased resilience. We have a good level of resilience at the moment, but we recognize that uh, things like cyber threats will continue to evolve. That is just, uh, we, we, we don't expect to conquer that. That's something we expect to work on continually. At the same time, um, things like uh, availability become much, much more important. And the, you know, the, the sort of traditional old school risks of fires and floods haven't gone away. So we need to be resilient to those too. The next point I touched on earlier on, which is greater access. So we want to in, increase the access. We want it to make it um, more practical and more cost effective for people to be able to access settlement in central bank money. So this links back to what I was talking about about the beginning, about our mission for um, financial stability, but it also links into things like the provision of a whole uh, digital currency, potentially. Uh, that is one way that we might be able to increase access. Um, and it's something that we're looking at. The next point moving around the circle is wider interoperability. So this is something that recognizes that we will need to interoperate with a wider range of platforms. Um, possibly to support different models of delivery versus payment. Again, moving into the sort of um, tokenization and blockchain, um, as well as more traditional architectures. But this is also a place where uh, potentially we can plug um, digital currency um, platforms in so that we can link that into the um, don't want to call it the legacy banking system, the, the current banking system, the current way of operating. And, you know, we're, it's early days yet, but we're, we're looking at how that might work. Improved user functionality, I think, speaks for itself, but we are looking at the um, opportunity just to, to make things work more efficiently, more effectively, but also give ourselves the capacity to, to uh, have longer operating hours. And then last of all, strengthening our end-to-end -end risk management. So this is really about, as we make that change, understanding the new risks that we bring in. So, 
you know, there are lots of opportunities in here, but those will bring new risks and making sure that we've got the risk management framework and the risk management information to be able to manage that effectively. Um, you know, and this really brings in, I think, sh shows you that this is a, about um, a, a policy change as much as it is about um, a technical change and an operational change. So those were all the topics and areas that I wanted to cover. I think we've got um, a reasonable amount of time for questions. I'm quite happy to um, take questions either in the chat box or, um, you know, just uh, to, to, to call them out. It's uh, over to you. Yeah, indeed. Um, don't be shy. Ask questions, please. I have a number of questions, but I would wait to see if they're being asked before joining in the end to, to hopefully have some time or I will ask them on email. Anyway, go ahead. Please uh, engage with Will. He's... Yeah, hi Will, Kamlesh here. Kamlesh, please go ahead. Yeah, hi. Yeah, so uh, what is the roadmap means uh, uh, when it will be available or it's just the plan or just the vision or what? Um, so from a digital currency perspective, it's a um, it's very much at the vision stage. Um, there's a tremendous amount of work for us to do. Um, and it's as much for us about understanding that uh, user proposition part as it is um, about developing technology. Um, a lot of the work that we've done, and we, we, uh, we did a discussion paper recently, a lot of the work we've done is really about um, understanding how it looks from a policy perspective. And we did a discussion paper, we've had a lot of feedback on that. We're now looking at how we take that to the next step to articulate a blueprint and a vision and delivery. I, I don't know what the timescale for that is, but I think s some of it will depend upon external factors, what happens in the global picture, how, how other currencies get on with their digitalization. You know, I think if we're, were one country or currency to, to race ahead, I think you would see a lot of people fast following. Um, there are also things like even the impact that uh, COVID-19 lockdowns have had on the use of physical cash. You know, we've seen a big decline in the use of cash here in the UK, which I you know, believe has been seen internationally as well. So all of these things start to come together to influence the timetable, but but we don't have a um, we don't have a target date just yet. Yeah, thank you. Because like like we heard like many news like the digital dollar project from Accenture in US, I, and then the China CBDC they are also doing something. So that's why I asked this question. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, the China. I mean, China is 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 forging ahead. Um, I think their their pilot is. I mean, well, their pilot project in most countries would be bigger than the, the entire system that you would need. Um, the, their pilot to me looks, it, it, it's, you know, what am I trying to say? It, when you look at how it works, it's, it's, it's like halfway between an instant payment system and a digital currency. Uh, it's quite interesting. I think it'll be interesting to see where they go next. But um, the other thing that's worth reading is they've published a list of the patents that they've applied for uh, and it's very broad. Um, I don't know whether they're necessarily actually going to develop all those technologies that they've registered patent applications for but it shows just how seriously they're taking it. Th there's a question in the in the chat box about third-party rule changes um, uh, I'm not sure, it, I'm, I, don't, I don't know if I quite understand the question, if, if somebody can jump on. Hi, yeah, hey, Jim, um, I can I ask the question? And it really is back to your diagram, showing sure. CBC, CD, CBDC flow you had 
the bank at the top, and then at the bottom you had the consumers in a sense accessing yeah. um, bank assets or CBDC through these third parties. And my question around that, right, that layer three there. Yeah. So in layer three at the bottom, where we have the payment interface providers, um, yeah. are there specific rule changes that are needed? for those payment interface providers different than the current systems at all? Or are they just, in place? Um, are the, I guess the current rules and regulations in place um, will work as is, I guess, for your C CBDC concept? I, I think almost definitely we will need to have C rule changes. So um, if you think about a scenario where, um, Let's think of a good example. So if you were to think about a scenario where your payment interface provider went out of business, um, okay, so your money is safe because it's on, on the ledger, you know, at the top of the picture. However, uh, if you can't get to it through your phone, um, then you need to access your money and you need to access your money quickly. Um, so so, so I just just sort of like finished that. So that's that's not dissimilar from the resolution regime for if your bank goes bust, but it is actually different. So we would need that's just an example of a set of rules. We would need a set of rules first of all to make sure that payment in interface providers actually going bust is a is a rare thing. But second of all, actually to make sure that 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 if it happens then your money is protected first and foremost and second you know and secondly you can access it quickly so it's those kinds of things um, there's a lot of work to do in that space uh, but that that's the kind of rule change we will need to see so then i'll say the cbdc model offers if i compare it if we had that same service if you will cbdc in the us the way you've constructed it there would be a significant difference in risk for our customers because currently we have FDIC in the U.S. to insure our accounts up to a certain limit. But with this, the model you're proposing, there really isn't going to be a limit. All of your, in a sense, currency that is CBTC would be secured. Yeah. And, and that, that's, what a, you've that's hit, a big difference for what it's worth. Yeah. And what you've, what you've hit on there is actually one of the um, financial stability risks, which is, you know, if, if there's... Um, concern over the stability of commercial banks what is to stop effectively a virtual run on a bank uh people going and flipping all of their commercial bank deposits into a cbdc where where it's safe and it's protected um now there are uh there are solutions to that problem um but it's something that's under you know it's actually one of the big problems to be solved about the launch of a cbdc Mm -hmm. um so yeah it's uh yeah i was i was speaking to some uh, i was speaking to some bitcoin developers um recently and they were just kind of going oh it's so easy for you guys because you can just make a set of rules and everyone has to follow it and it was like yeah <clears throat> that part of it's easy but we've got a few problems to solve that you guys don't have <laughs> um so yeah it's uh it's an interesting space yeah well, there's a uh, so can we have uh, somebody, uh, uh, Jim, you have a uh, follow-up? No, no, I'm done. Thanks. That was awesome. I appreciate it. All right. Uh, looks like Paulo is asking a question where uh, he wants to see whether there's a, he, he, let him ask the question. Sure. Uh, thank you, Vipin, and thank you, William, for your time and insights regarding this, this very interesting topic. My question is in regards to, well, you have wholesale payments and retail payments currently. And there's this whole mm -hmm. discussion about wholesale CBDCs and retail CBDCs, who's going to implement each of, each of those. What, are, what is your take in terms of interdependencies between these two types of approaches and, and timeline? Is there any, any relationship precedence between wholesale and retail? What are your thoughts on that? Um, okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll take it in reverse order. Um, I think timeline is, is going to be probably demand-led. So I think if, um, you know, if there's strong demand, that helps with the timeline. Uh, I also think that some of the policy questions around the wholesale 
space are probably a little bit easier to resolve. So, you know, if there's if there's uh, a good case to do wholesale quickly, it's probably a bit easier to do quickly. Um, but it might not it might not happen first because there might not be the demand. If you see what I mean. In terms of the interdependencies, um, I mean it, it, it's theoretically possible to um, to 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 make to have one solution that 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 meets all of them. I think practically uh, it will look very very different. Um, the difference between wholesale and retail, obviously, is with with wholesale. You're uh, you're dealing with regulated institutions, um, and there's there's a couple of advantages to that. Uh, what one is obviously you have a regulatory framework there that you can you can modify um, and you can change. And regulated institutions kind of they might not like being regulated, but they expect to be regulated. Uh, whereas regulating the general public about how they use their money is a, a whole different conversation um the the second thing is a more sort of you know pr prosaic advantage which is that um from the perspective of someone like the bank of england we already have relationships with those regulated institutions so when when you start to look at a platform like um utility settlement coin or something like that you're already dealing with people that 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 we have a relationship with and it just it makes that conversation a little bit more straightforward uh, i hope hope that answers your question so, so as a follow-up question is it fair to say that although wholesale cbdc's are not um uh, demand led by the end user they might occur um in first hand uh by one of two uh, options, whether because it's easier to implement or because there is a, essentially a reaction move that needs to be taken according to other wholesale CBDCs around the world? Yeah, quite possibly. Uh, I think, I, I think, you know, there are some market forces in here, uh, uh, is what I think I'm saying. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Okay. Lots of questions coming up on the on the chat, yeah. but we have to we can probably um, sort of group them in a couple of areas. One is, of course, the whole Bitcoin thing. Uh, the second is the you know which I would defer at this point. Uh, the second thing is about the standards, like um, for example, Eugenio uh, is asking whether global business standards like ISO 2022 and interaction with technical activities like ISO TC 307, um, how will that affect? But my question would uh, ask a follow up with, to that would be, why are you guys focused on uh, ISO 2022? I know that a lot of work has gone into it, but it seemed more like a union of uh, different standards that exist already. That's first first uh, comment. Uh, second is it does not have the modern uh, cryptographic uh, underpinnings inside it. I mean, the messages stand alone. And in fact, it's shown that those standalone messages have a way to be tampered with, especially if you can interfere uh, in the middle. Uh, so the ISO 2022 standard seems peculiarly unsuited for the modern age. Uh, in that sense. Uh, the second uh, part of my question, which also comes along there, is whether um, you heard about the ITU uh, work that has just started under the DCGI, which is Digital Currency Global Initiative, and they seem to be focused a lot more on technical standards and uh, some of the questions that you raised about consensus algorithms and so on, they are going to be addressed in that DCGI uh, uh, setting. And I believe uh, you, you guys should participate in that because it's very uh, interesting and important. Anyway, go ahead. Uh, the technical versus ISO 20, 20 or 22 timeliness. Um, so yeah, I think 
I mean, I think the technical standards is something that we will in, engage with in, in due course. I think there's just, it's not the top of our list at the moment. Um, ISO 20022, yeah, I, I'm, so I think there are ways to secure it that, that um, prevent the tampering. I think there's a couple of things about it. What, one is it's a standard that has achieved the level of adoption and it's, it's definitely in motion. That's the first thing. Um, and I think, you know, so like I said, I, I don't think, I don't, we, sh we shouldn't lose uh, the work that's gone into that when, when, when we can leverage it. Um, what's the second thing I was going to say about it? Um, yeah, I, mean, I think the fundamental the fundamentals of transactions it allows you to integrate into the um, existing financial infrastructure as well, because none of these currencies are going to be able to just exist on their own. Um, you know, one of the one of the interesting challenges around all of it is how, how do you get there? Um, we can we can launch a digital currency, but but actually the adoption curve of it, if you look at the adoption curves of any kind of payment products it's um it's never linear it's always very slow at the start um and then you, you tend to underestimate adoption in the short term sorry overestimate adoption in the short term and underestimate it in the long term so um what's a good example uh fast payments the instant payments solution in the uk uh saw very very little use in its first year uh, you know, a few hundreds of thousands of transactions. It's now, a, you know, a busy day is 8 million, you know, which nobody ever thought, nobody foresaw when it, when it went in. And, and I think CBDC will, will likely be the same, um, that it will start quite quietly. And, and then when people uh, find the use case for it, find the, the, the convenient thing that it gives them, will start to adopt it very very rapidly as as has happened as well with with contactless te technology um so while we're in that period of getting from the current world into the new world we'll we'll need to be able to interoperate um so the second uh, thing that came up was with um from junji uh, kato from uh, Itau bank brazil now the he says how 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 is the cbdc initiative accelerated by open banking that's placed in europe or on the other hand uh, how gdpr may add complexity to privacy on the cbdc um i think um i think it works in parallel to open banking um i mean i think the the um the purpose of open banking was and is to um, actually uh, open up the market a little bit. Uh, so we have a situation, you know, certainly in Europe, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm not close to what's what it is globally, but certainly in Europe and definitely in the UK, where um, commercial banks, retail banks, own the entire stack. So they are they are um, managing the ledger and the accounts and the balance sheet, they're creating the products, they're marketing the products, and then they control the access to those products through um, apps or, um, you know, online portals, whatever they might be. And that makes it very difficult for people to purchase different products, you know, maybe mortgages and savings and uh, retail current accounts from different providers. So open banking was really tackling that was about saying actually it should be easier for consumers to be able to get their financial products from different providers rather than getting tied in by people owning the entire stack. Um, I think a central bank digital currency can complement that in that it's just another thing that makes it easier for people to um, uh, access different types of products and move their money between those products. Um, notwithstanding the, the problem that Jim raised earlier about 
people just holding all of their money in the CBDC, actually that pushes the banks a little bit harder to think about what their product offerings might be. Um, so I think that's how it sits with, with open banking. GDPR, I view as being quite helpful, actually, because I think that we will need to, as I was speaking about digital identity earlier, we will need to face into the um, data and information problems that a central bank digital currency creates. You know, whether we like it or not, whether you, whether you think surveillance is a great thing or whether you think surveillance is a terrible thing, wherever, wherever you are on that spectrum, a ledger that shows how everybody is spending their money is um, a source of enormous information. So actually having a framework about what you can do and what you can't do uh, with that information is, um, is actually a, a very important thing. Uh, I think trying to perhaps develop that framework while you're trying to develop the currency just makes it even harder, uh, if that makes sense. Yeah, indeed. Uh, I think today they, they are all being ca called in the US, all the big tech companies have been called to the Congress uh, to testify and to justify the way they have been, uh, they have been gathering information on everybody and yeah. sort of misusing that stuff. And only legal uh, uh, protection like GDPR or very strong, uh, you know, laws that have some teeth will stop this uh, practice because otherwise they 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 do run rampant. Um, the other question that came up was the CBD discussion paper. Um, there was a uh, uh, there was. Uh, debate on whether you should use the uh, DLT or traditional centralized model. Uh, is there a direction that you guys favor or is it still open question? We, we are deliberately open about that. Um, and the reason is, uh, is really about saying we need to understand um, what technical capabilities are required um, and then we'll, we'll select the best technology to deliver them. Um, internally, I would say there's a spectrum of opinion. There are some real distributed ledger skeptics. There are some, you know, absolute um, advocates and, um, you know, people like myself who sit s somewhere in between the two. But I think that we made that point because we wanted to say, look, we really need to understand what the proposition is um, how we're going to deliver that proposition, you know, through our layered model um, that I've got on the screen at the moment, then we can understand what the ledger is, rather than start off from, right, it, distributed ledger, it's going to be a blockchain, now how should we do it? Yeah, uh, sounds good because, you know, based on uh, conversations, there seem to be uh, a lot of skeptics on either side. Um, um, I think we have come to the end of uh, our hour, uh, and it's been a fascinating discussion. Unfortunately, we haven't uh, gotten to through uh, a lot of the questions, but that's uh, been, you know, the, your presentation is beautiful in in many ways because it 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 covers this ground in the course of about 20 to 40 minutes and it gives a uh a, what we call uh you know a view from a sort of a privileged position which is <laughs> one of the one of the uh, more uh, forward looking banks um so I hope to continue some of these discussions, uh, which, which we always uh, end up talking about, but never seem to actually follow through because there is so much happening. Um, one of the things I would like to do is to have this uh, slide deck, if, if your uh, institution allows it to be available from our site. And of course the video will be posted up there. Sure. 
Uh, so that's the other. Uh, the, so maybe we, you know, we need to uh, sort of talk about this every quarter, every uh, half year or something, because it's a yeah. moving target. Uh, and we are deeply engrossed in it uh, ourselves in the sense of the uh, capital market SIG. And uh, we will uh, soon have somebody talking about, you know, the nitty gritty of, um, you know, using MPC or something to, to move it to control the movement of large amounts of money. So, uh, so we do have that technical uh, bent here sometimes, but we also have, uh, we try to be open, like having people like you uh, participate, even though you're, uh, uh, you're uh, head of future technology, you're also seem to be plugged into the policy side of the equation. Yeah. So, uh, again, thanks. And Thank uh, you. Uh, we hope to continue this and we hope to give you some of our, uh, you know, our first efforts at, uh, at uh, writing something more comprehensive, but from a more commercial viewpoint. Um, That'd be great. Thank you. Thank you, and, and thanks to everyone. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Nick, and thank you, Will. Thank you. Um, we'll have the, uh, you know, everything on, on the site, and I'm going to turn, turn off the meeting so everybody will get knocked off. Sorry. Okay. See you later. Bye-bye. Okay, bye now.